so early after lunch. Uh, I'm Santiago Mola, and I'm presenting Bubblefish, which is uh, our project to build a universal code parser. Uh, so I'm the lead data engineer at Sourced. This is a company building uh, an open source stack for uh, to apply artificial intelligence to code. And I'm working on a data pipeline to analyze all open source code online. So all open source code for us includes every public Git repository, every public uh, repository also on Bitbucket, on GitLab, or self-hosted. And that also includes not only the last version of the code, but also every single commit in every repository. And that's not focused only on a small number of languages, but uh, also means analyzing source code across uh, hundreds of languages. So whatever we do with source code, we did on with massive amount of source code and in a wide uh, diversity of, of it. And as you will see, that kind of uh, uh, influences a lot of design decisions on, on this project. Well, my note, uh, I'm not a programming languages expert. So what you are going to see is the work of a bunch of data engineers and other scientists trying to make sense out of the field of, of source code analysis. So here's the story uh, that leads us to, to this point. A couple of years ago, we were working on an application to uh, help uh, recruitment of developers. So we were building a database of developer profiles. And in order to do that, we did some shallow analysis based on Git history. And so basically, we are just gathering some metrics on, on developers. And we did this by fetching every Git repository. We applied a page rank to, to contributors. We calculated some metrics, such as the number of uh, bytes contributed by each person per language. So quite easy things from the point of view of, of analysis. And then last year, we started facing some uh, problems with this, with the system. Uh, for example, we had to ignore comments to get some more accurate metrics. And we solved that with regular expressions. Then we needed to detect the usage of some libraries. Uh, we did that with more regular expressions. At some point, we, did, we needed to detect more than 170 libraries and ecosystems, where ecosystems are maybe a set of libraries and APIs or something more broad than a specific library or framework. And we did that with a generic tokenizer with some pattern matching. So up to this point, we're using like this pretty ad hoc stuff, pretty ugly solutions, but that they did the work for this simple stuff. But then data science came in. Uh, we created a data science team, and they started doing data science stuff. Uh, mainly training uh, deep learning models on source code for different applications. And so we got exposed to a whole class of new problems. Um, for example, extracting a data set of identifiers used in every file in GitHub. Uh, that includes uh, function names, variable names, and so on, across every language, across every repository, every revision, and so on. Uh, we solved that with Pigments. So Pigments is a Python syntax highlighter. It contains like 400 lexers. So we just reuse that uh, in order to apply the lexers, select the identifiers. OK, that kind of works. Then we got asked for a data set of all tokens inside the small Go function, where small is any arbitrary measure of small such bytes. And we solved that with a, we wrote an extractor based on the Go AST uh, standard library that was quite specific, but also did the work pretty well. And the next request is extract a data set of every token in every language arranged uh, per block, whatever block or scope is in each language. It's a fancy definition. At, so at this point, we just don't have any more ad hoc solutions for, for this kind of problem. And this is the data engineering team trying to cope with all these uh, crazy data science uh, requests. So we had to take a break and stop doing these kind of very ad hoc solutions for each request and try to come up with a more general way of, of extracting this kind of information. And we realized that all the all data we needed so far can be easily extracted for, uh, from AGSTs. 
So if we had a way to obtain an AST from any file, any language on, on GitHub, we could uh, extract, uh, we could fulfill our, our previous uh, feature request uh, kind of trivially. So the first problem we faced is that, or okay, something pretty obvious, every language is different. And every language has very different AST uh, definitions. Even each parser on similar languages, or even each parser of the same language, have massively different uh, ASTs. For example, we tried three Java parsers to realize that all of them produced three absolutely com completely different things. So we need we needed some kind of normalization to to be able to work across languages. But um, creating a single AST definition uh, that could work across any language and with a quite good level of detail doesn't seem possible to us. So we came up to this conclusion that we should deal with this heterogeneity by using uh, language-specific ASTs uh, where we can annotate each node in the AST with some generalized concepts that we can use across a wide variety of languages. So our first approach was uh, using existing grammars. For, we, we picked the uh, Antler project, which is a great parser generator, and it contains existing implementations for more than 120 languages. So we said, okay, maybe we can tune them, uh, tune these grammars to um, produce these annotations. Uh, maybe they, they can do the job. First thing we realized is, well, something pretty specific to, to to passing with grammars, but they produce a two verbose parse trees, which require further normalization. And adapting and maintaining in them seems too costly for us. In some cases, we will need to rewrite these grammars from scratch. So that's where we uh, reach our current approach, which is uh, after the realization that most languages have an official parser producing decent AST. If not an official in the standard library, they have a de facto standard. So we should be able to reuse these parsers. And then add as a post-processing step some minimal structure normalization, which is also reversible, but minor detail at, at this point, and annotate with these general concepts on this language-specific AST. The result of this post-processing step is what we are calling in this project uh, universal after syntax trees, or UASTs. Um, so let's see an example of uh, how we can go from code to one of these UAS, defined UASTs. So the process of creating these UASTs have three steps. First is parsing. Uh, parsers create uh, an AST that is language specific, it's in JSON, and it has preformed. So this JSON can have absolutely any form. It can be a list of lists in usually in Lisp like uh, ASTs or it can be in, in Java or Python, they are, <coughs> they are JSON objects with arbitrary fields and values. And then we have a normalization step when we, where we take that freeform JSON and we feed the, that into a normalized structure, but without touching the relation between nodes. So whatever is a child or a sibling in the original AST, it's still a uh, uh, it has the same relation in the UAST. So we, we just keep the tree structure as it is. And then there's the annotation step where we annotate each node with language independent roles. So roles are, at, at this point, the only language independent annotation that we have. And a role is defined as uh, describing an aspect that is generalized on, on one node in the AST. So let's take as this simple example on Python and Java. Uh, of adding A and B, just actually the same code in both. Honestly, I put this example because it's the only one that fits in the slides for the next slide. So, so on the parsing step, we have uh, two parsers for, for each of them. They produce something completely different. Of course, you can f find some, some similarities. As, uh, for example, in Python, you have this AST type, which is now in every node. And which has a left um, property, which has also another node, 
we know it we know it's a node because it has the AST type two. It's a name, it has a field file field with identifier. And with Java we see a similar thing. Each node has an internal class expressing which kind of node it is, it has a property with a plus and, and so on. So completely different things. And then that goes to the normalization step. Uh, you omitted some fields. Uh, actually, the UST contains more information, such as the position in the original source code, where things start and end. Uh, but I omitted uh, secondary information for, for brevity now. So as you see now, the values of stuff are still very different. But the structure, this is the kind of structure normalization I was talking about. So we have uh, just the same kind of fields, internal type, uh, the children of, the, of these nodes, a token which corresponds to the original token in the source code of that node, and some arbitrary properties. So this is a lossless transformation because uh, eventually what, what we cannot normalize, we just put it in this properties map and we have arbitrary stuff there. And then we have the annotation where we add the roles field, as you see here and here, that define that this node has this specific function that is actually the same across languages. So the binop in Python is stacked as binary expression, which comes from the UAST specification. Uh, the names are simple identifiers. There are also qualified identifiers. Um, we have the left hand of the expression as binary expression left, and so on. Can you see something really weird on the difference on that's to this? This is just the same, but I omitted everything that is language specific, and I got only the roles of each node and the children and the token. So it should look it should be the same for a simple thing, right? The fact that we keep the original relation between nodes uh, from the original AST means that uh, while we have uh, generalized what uh, uh, the annotations of each node means, the relation between different nodes is not normalized. So, for example, in this case, the operation at, which is uh, part of the binary expression, is a child node of the binary expression in Python, while in Java it's the same node. The same node uh, that is annotated with binary expression is the one defining the operator. Um, we have to deal with this kind of variety of structures, uh, even if we have the common annotations. So now that we know where do we want to add or what do we want to obtain from this process, we can introduce BubbleFish. BubbleFish is a self-hosted server for source code parsing. It can parse any file in any supported language, extract an AST from it, and convert it to a common representation called UAST, providing, providing a, sing, a single interface uh, to analyze source code in different languages. Uh, so as the title of the presentation said, uh, the universal code parsing server. So here's an uh, overview of the architecture. Uh, Bubblefish, Bubblefish is a client server architecture. Uh, the client is whatever application that needs uh, source code parsing. It can send requests to a, to a server that then delegates the parsing to different drivers. It's the driver providing support for a language. And these drivers are uh, split in two parts. The parser, which produces this language-specific uh, AST, and the normalizer, which normalizes the structure and annotates with uh, language-independent annotations. So in a driver, the parser is implemented in any language, usually the source one. So for example, the Python uh, parser is implemented in Python, and the Java one is implemented in Java too. Uh, it's not mandatory. So for example, the bus driver uh, has the parser implemented in Java too. So we try to just reuse the best library or the most accepted library that there is for parsing a language, or at least the, the one producing better results, uh, in order for us to be, uh, for this to be a, an effort that we, can, uh, that we can manage. And then the normalizer is implemented in Go. Um, implementing the normalizers of every language uh, in, in the same language allows us to reuse a lot of code. So we have the Bubblefish SDK providing a lot of utilities that make uh, the uh, tree normalization and annotation process much easier. Then the whole thing is packaged as a Docker image, 
and that's uploaded to the to Docker Hub, to the Bubble Fish organization that serves as a central repository of drivers. And then we have the server. The server exposes a gRPC protocol to pass files and get the UHT and manages the execution of drivers. These drivers are executed in a lightweight uh, container runtime. Uh, it's uh, its own runtime, not actually Docker. So it's written in Go and using lib container, which is the library that Docker uses to execute containers under the hood. So the server executes drivers as containers based on Docker images, but doesn't really depend on a Docker daemon on runtime, or actually it has no other runtime dependencies, which is pretty convenient for, for deployment. And then we have the clients. Just you can generate uh, the uh, client code with gRPC, gRPC for whatever language you are using. And we are now working on a C++ library with bindings for multiple languages um, to uh, make easier to manipulate the UHST. And then the protocol, it's pretty simple. Uh, right now we have just one type of message, which is a parse request. You send the content of, uh, of a file, and optionally you add the path and the language. So for in our case, um, we are parsing arbitrary stuff. We don't know the language be uh, beforehand. So what we do is that we send a parse request without the language. Um, the Bubblefish server uses Henry, which is another library we we created for detecting language uh, to detect language and then roll to the appropriate driver uh, depending on this detection. So the status of the project, uh, so we start like six months ago. Um, the project has a team of three full-time developers plus a few more uh, part-time contributors. And um, we have uh, an initial UHST specification and a working server implementation. Uh, you can run, run them with uh, either as a standalone binary or with a Docker container, which is already published. Um, and then we have two beta drivers for Python and Java. Python is the most complete, so okay. Python is the most complete. Java is the second most complete, and then we have 30 more work-in-progress drivers. Uh, these, inclu these include JavaScript, Clojure, Elixir, also Erlang, R. Well, we're, we're working a lot of them. These are still not ready to be used, but it's, uh, they are upcoming. And then we have published some showcase tools. Um, we are at the moment providing this just uh, for you to have a feel about how is working with Bubblefish, uh, what can you do. Uh, so these are still not really like, really polished tools, but they are just demos. Uh, we have this tokenizer, a cyclomatic complexity calculator, and empath complexity calculator too. And this can work exclusively on the, on the UHST. They work on the UHST, and, and, and so they work across every supported language. So that's it. Um, so you can check, if you want to know more, you can check the documentation at this unpronounceable address, doc at bblf.sh, so bubble fish without bubbles. Uh, we have released everything as open source with Apache 2 license or GPL license, depending on the component. You can check out on our, our GitHub uh, website. Uh, you can check out also the Bubblefish Improvement Proposals, which is our community process to uh, standardize the Bubblefish protocol and the UHST specification. And we are also hanging out all day in, in Slack, so you can chat with us there. So thank you. Questions? So there's plenty of time for questions, so I will... Yeah, I
you mean cases like uh, like the, the operator can be the children so oh, so the question was how are we solving the problem of the relation between nodes not not being standardized so um, currently um, the specification uh, each role has a documentation of what does it mean to be annotated with this role. And roles are also documented with what's their relation to other roles. So currently, and this, this is a pretty early approach, uh, we are defining um, what are the possible relations, uh, how you should look uh, for the next node. For example, in the binary expression we have defined that you should look uh, at the operator in the same node and then in the next and, and then in the next node before finding another uh, another role that breaks that kind of relationship. Um, that uh, so so far um, that worked for Python for Java to work for some application that we are building and for some specific cases. So now we are discussing if uh, and I think that we have to do. If we have to do a, another kind of annotation uh, related to the role, uh, indicating, indicating uh, cross references uh, in the UAST. So I think that uh, somehow soon we'll add uh, some kind of mechanism for you to say this is a binary expression and you should find the related node for operation on its uh, child or its parent or something like that. I'm um, thinking most, most probably on relative references, but that's something that we are still thinking about how, how to solve. Um, cool, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, one of the things I noticed is you showed Python and Java as uh, examples, and I guess in terms of how of the many language paradigms they are, those two are relatively uh, similar. How? well does the UAST approach work when you map it to, say, logic programming or other paradigms that are somewhat different? Yeah. So we are pretty early point at, uh, on that. Um, but th let's say that that's something that we are still exploring. So um, we are having a lot of like, philosophical debate about at, up to which point should we create generalized concepts? Because if you uh, want uh, roles that generalize across every language, you are probably getting just like four or five, right? Uh, not, not many things. On the other hand, if you go and create uh, specific roles for every, every possible concept in programming language, you are possibly creating just uh, the union of every concept in every uh, programming language without any general, generalization, right? So uh, at the moment we are we are still exploring up to which point we want to generalize. Uh, in in any case, something that we are pretty sure is that we need somehow to uh, have some kind of hierarchy of uh, of, um, of annotations, so that. Um, it's also important to know that a node can be annotated with many concepts, and a role doesn't necessarily, in fact, it usually never uh, convey, uh, describes the full meaning of the node in the original language, but only an aspect. So uh, there should be uh, roles that indicate something that an aspect of a node that is actually generally stable across different, uh, in, between Lisp and Java, and there will be other in fact, there are other uh, other roles that work uh, or that that will be present only in a class of languages. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, but but we we are still exploring where what's the the, the sweet spot on, on that. So okay, hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned a few things that you're looking to measure, such as cyclomatic complexity or n-path complexity, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, do you have longer-term goals for the kind of information that you're looking to reveal from this kind of tool? So, for instance, you're looking to compare programming languages, um, like with regards to those kind of measures. Or so, sorry, I did not fully get the question. 
So, so what kind of um, insights, do you, you have any particular aspirations for insights that you're trying to reveal from using um, Babelfish? Yeah. So our most pressing uh, need, in fact, uh, currently we are building uh, a couple of demos. One of the things that, uh, one of the first problems that we want to solve with Babelfish uh, internally at source, but actually what we are producing will be also open source soon, is to solve uh, this kind of request. So, um, so this kind of data sets that we are extracting with Babelfish are served to, uh, we're using them to build models that uh, one of them will be for uh, matching similarity of projects uh, across different languages and what other will be for uh, source, code, source code completion. Uh, we can build a single model uh, or have a single training process uh, to build uh, models for code completion on different languages or even, um, or even to, uh, to use patterns from one language to help in the training of a different language. So, um, these are actually just pretty simple things if you have the AST, but at the time that these requests were made, um, the data science team just didn't ask for more ambitious thing because just they couldn't believe that we were possibly able to, to extract them, right? Uh, if we have uh, some uh, kind of normalization of the AST, now they can start asking for more ambitious things and, um, and they are now working on, 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 how, on solving the problem how to uh, adapt the, the, um, the word embedding uh, algorithms that they use for deep learning, adapting them for trees instead of, uh, instead of a list of tokens in order to be able to build more accurate uh, deep learning models. So, Sourced as a company, this is the kind of things that we want to extract from, from, from Babelfish. Uh, so we want to extract, we want to use it to extract uh, many different representations of, of source code in order to build models. But uh, we hope that uh, with the help of the community we can see, I'm pretty sure that we can see many other kind of applications that are also possible with this. Thanks. By the way, um, the kind of showcases, uh, ah, okay. for example, the, the, this tokenizer is kind of like the first proof of concept for this kind of usage, internal use cases. Cyclomatic complexity and empath complexity were just stuff that we don't need currently internally, but they came up as, as hey, if you can calculate these kind of things on the UAST, then you are not doing it that bad. So they are more like validations, validation scenarios on, okay, if we can do this, we are on the right track. Hey, um, I wonder what drove the decision to use uh, Golang for the normalizer? Yeah, so um, the, in, there was an easy decision for us because uh, for uh, more than two years, our company has been using Go for almost everything. So it was kind of the, the company language. Uh, that's basically the, the main driver for, for this decision. Uh, there's the, it being a language that was easy to build a self-contained contained binary was also something that was a good fit for this um, for this architecture, what, where we aim to build drivers that are Docker contained, uh, Docker containers that are very small, um, but that was not really determinant. Determinant. The main thing is that it's our language. So we don't discard that uh, if uh, in the future, I mean, if we get uh, if we get uh, contributors to driver creators and writing normalizers in other languages is something that people feel like doing, uh, I guess that, that will be okay. But since 
now we are the ones that writing all of those drivers. So internally we are writing all of them in the in the same language. The server, on the other hand, will uh, will stay go probably in the all the foreseeable future, mainly because of the usage of containers. Uh, because uh, all the tooling on containers is written in Go from Docker. Um, being in Go, we can reuse a lot of this uh, tooling to for the front end. And that has been very valuable. Other questions? I forget uh, the author, but I remember I think it was a paper about um, comparing very similar programs written in Python and Ruby, and uh, the other sort of compiled step by step each of these programs and found that they became more and more similar the closer to bytecode they became. So I was wondering if you have any plans or have thought about, at least for languages that generate bytecode, maybe comparing them on that dimension as well as the syntax trees? So you mean uh, analyzing on the bytecode, the native bytecode instead of the original source code, right? Or in addition to? Or in addition to, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Um, so the, our main problem here is that, uh, as I said initially, we are building this on, on a pipeline to analyze source code in massive amounts. And we want to analyze all uh, public source code. So one of our problems is that we cannot rely on the build system to cooperate. Uh, we cannot rely on a build system being present because there are a lot of repositories that do not use any build system. At least they do not say which one they use. Um, and even more, we cannot rely on the code to compile because even the, a lot of code has the build system, but at least by, with the default commands, it doesn't build. And we cannot rely on being able to solve the dependencies. So one of the things that, because, uh, so a, a thing that usually comes up when, when we are doing this uh, per file analysis of, of source code is, uh, hey, if you are looking at individual files, you don't have the context. Uh, you cannot do things such as resolving a symbol. And that's right. Uh, it's a conscious decision to limit ourselves to this, to this scope because it's a scope that works, that works everywhere. Uh, it works whether you can or cannot fetch the dependencies. I can think, for example, the, the Go case, which is a mess. Um, you are, if you take a point in the past of any Go repository in six months, you are almost 100% sure to be guaranteed to that code not building. So, uh, unless you are on, on Google, that everything is a moral repo or something like that. And so since we want to analyze the whole history of source code, it's very hard for us to rely on anything that, that means being able to, to build. But on the other hand, uh, we do not discard that, um, that we could uh, add some of that functionality or uh, integrate with other tools of uh, source code analysis that did do this kind of analysis at at, uh, at build time. I think about Kite, for example. Um, but that will have to be always uh, an addition um, to be used by users that have control of the repositories and can guarantee that that this kind of analysis is going to work, that the that the project is going to build, and so on. So I, I would like to to go to that approach in the future. But by now we are focusing on stuff that works for 99% of the code on, on GitHub. Any other question? Nope. Uh, Thank you.